to episode 5 of Wikimove, a podcast where we discuss the future of the Wikimedia movement. I am Nicole Eber and with me is Niki Zeuner. We are both working in Wikimedia Deutschland's movement strategy and global relations team. This episode was recorded at 1300 CEST on August 25th, 2022. Things may have changed. Since we recorded this show, but what we still know is that by 2030, Wikimedia will become the essential infrastructure of the ecosystem of free knowledge. And anyone who shares our vision will be able to join us. And in addition to the podcast, we also have a meta page and a web page, and you can find all the relevant links in the show notes as well. And on today's show, we will talk about peer support in the context of recommendation number six, which is invest in skills and leadership development. Oh, and by the way, today we won't have a new segment because we are going into a summer break and this episode will be released after, so we don't want to bore you with old news. So let's move right to our interview for today's show. Our topic again is peer support, which includes peer learning, peer, peer matching, peer, all kinds of things that we still haven't imagined. What's the background? Our movement is constantly growing and diversifying all across the globe. And that's also part of the, this movement strategic direction is that we grow. New people are joining, new communities are forming every day. As volunteers and as staff of affiliates and the WMF, they, they have to acquire new skills. They have to figure out how to organize, form organizations, do outreach and advocacy, and how to work with institutions and with governments. And for every skill or piece of knowledge that a Wikimedian is looking for, there's probably another Wikimedian out there who has figured it out or has the answer or has just done it the week before or last year. But how do they find each other? So today we want to talk to Rebecca O'Neill and Jessica Stevenson, who are both testing new ways for connecting the people of our movement for mutual aid. Their projects could become what's outlined as an action in Recommendation 6, which says... Establish a service that facilitates connecting or matching peers across the movement for teaching and learning skills. So, Nicole, do you want to introduce our guests? Yes. Um, first of all, we are very happy to welcome Rebecca O'Neill here with us. Um, Rebecca has a doctorate in digital media from the University of Hull. Since 2017, she has been the project coordinator of the Wikimedia Community Ireland and is based in Dublin. Rebecca works with various groups and institutions across Ireland to improve understanding, use and representation of Ireland and Irish topics on Wikipedia and its sister projects. And a large portion of her work focuses on improving and also strengthening the representation of women and also content relating to Ireland on Wikipedia and also on the Irish language Wikipedia. And we are also excited to welcome Jessica Stevenson with us. Jessica joined the Wikimedia Foundation in April 2021 as the Learning and Evaluation Program Officer with the Community Resources Department. She's based in Prague in the Czech Republic. Jessica has 18 years of professional experience in the design, management and evaluation of social and economic development projects, working alongside national and international NGOs, the public sector and also United Nations agencies. We look very much forward to our conversation with you today. So we've invited you guys today because you both are involved in sort of join, jo uh, connected, but separate projects that have to do with peer learning and peer matching and peer support. So I'm going to start with you, Rebecca. Can you say a few words about what is the capacity exchange, this thing that you've been in, uh, developing with some other people in the movement? So the capacity exchange is a pilot project to create a platform to aid fundamentally, I suppose, discoverability um, of peers, resources, capacities across the movement. So looking for um, existing, but also requested or needed um, capacities, resources and assets. So to map what people have as regards capacities within the Wikimedia movement, but also what people are looking for and creating a platform in which we can start to understand, uh, collate and generate, I suppose, more connectivity across the movement. Mm -hmm. So if I, like if I'm a, a new Wikimedian and um, I want to start a user group, I could go on there and say, 
I'm looking for a startup help with a, how to do a user group and how to form a nonprofit in, I don't know, Nigeria. And then I could maybe find somebody who can help me with that. Exactly. So it could be, as you say, kind of fundamentals of setting up a new group. It could be governance. It could be around diversity. It could be around projects. Um, it could be something as, as simple as looking for a mentor to help with grant writing for the first time, um, but also finding people, say, operating within similar contexts to you, even if they are quite remote from you, that you can learn from. Um, but as you said, also those resources that perhaps you could take and adapt and amend to your particular uh, context without having to to write it from scratch. So giving people, I suppose, that, that initial um, uh, boost, be it, I suppose, mentoring, as in kind of people working quite closely collaborating together or people being able to find those resources that have already been created so that they don't have to to start from zero every time. That makes sense. So Jessica, what's let's what is let's connect and how does that relate to to this or how you know how is it different and how is it similar? Thank you so much Nicole. Um so let's connect was born out of, you know, all these conversations around movement strategy and also um, rethinking the grant making process. There was a call from communities to go beyond financial support and finding ways that to best um, support skills development and really trying to do that through a more horizontal ways. So connecting peers, connecting colleagues, people in the movement who are facing similar challenges and context um, as Rebecca mentioned. So it's uh, Let's Connect is a peer learning program. It's open for any Wikimedian who wants to learn and share skills with peers. And um, as Rebecca said, this can be around organizational issues such as pr writing proposals, evaluating the impact of work, um, the great um, question around how do we retain volunteers? How do we best train volunteers? How can we innovate in some of our programmatic work? But also as well, we want to focus on interpersonal skills that are so important for the movement. So how do we create those skills for creating safe spaces, for managing conflict, for being inclusive? Um, so there's a number of skills that these um, learning spaces are, are sharing um, with each other from peers. And um, one thing that is really interesting is that we're innovating in different formats. So one is the type of workshop learning clinic where community members can come and share and interact and practice some skills with others. But we also want one-on-one -on -one connections because we think they're very important in creating that human connection and really contextualizing support. So the learner and the sharer can come together and understand each other's context and over a coffee, be able to discuss um, not only wiki related things, but also um, human related things and, and connect as a movement. So what we're doing, um, we are supporting these spaces um, by offering information about who is doing what and where. And we are hoping this is already going to your second question of the connection with capacity exchange is that the capacity exchange will be the main um, tool, the main cell in this process where we can use that to connect people and what Let's Connect does is then once people have connected and they might need some support for that connection. So um, we come in to help organize that space, organize information, give them some guidance and see how that connection works. Um, and if they need to, any support to, to be able to connect. Because sometimes, especially for newcomers, there are barriers to connect, such as language barriers. Sometimes people feel afraid because they may feel very new in the movement and they don't have things that they feel they can share. And so we want to, with the program, um, reduce some of those barriers and make people feel that we all have something to learn from each other and to put the support systems in place, be it financial, connectivity, translation, guidance, so that those connections um, can happen. So we see ourselves as a little arm um, that the capacity exchange will, will be able to direct to people towards when they connect and they need more support. I'd be interested uh, from you, Rebecca, we, t we talked about this also in the prep conversations, the, the main issue that you wanted to solve with capacity exchange. What, what were you thinking? What was the impulse of initiating this project? Those of us who are both new or um, old timers, I suppose, in the movement um, are aware of the perennial issue or become very aware very quickly of discoverability. 
Um, I've been involved in community work in, in the Wikimedia movement since 2014. And ever since I've attended Wikimanias or other conferences, um, you have that kind of serendipitous discovery of work that other people are doing. But how do you facilitate that out, outside of those very kind of, not necessarily exclusive, but spaces that only happen once, twice, three times a year and are only necessarily available to people who can who can travel, who have access to scholarships, things like that. You know, there has been kind of a, a criticism of, of Meta that it, it doesn't allow for very easy discoverability and that, you know, it is it is a host to an awful lot of projects that perhaps may look current, but when you scratch beneath the surface, they have been, you know, kind of shelved or mothballed or otherwise kind of left as kind of archival material within Meta. So really what we're looking to do with the platform is to create something where um, who you contact as a person is very obvious. Um, the fact that it is staying up to date is very obvious that it's, you know, it's a current project. This is a current capacity that can be shared um, and that people can find them based on categories, based on where they are happening, based on who is facilitating them, be that a person or a group. So it's really about making, it's it's about surfacing what is happening in the movement in a more accessible way. And we've been aware that the way that we have done things up until now has not um, helped with that in the past. You know, Meta does not facilitate easy discover, uh, discovery. So this idea of somebody out there is building this wheel, um, but based on all these barriers of geographic, time, language, you just can't find the information that you're looking for, or you might be using different terminology for the same thing. So using things like, as I said, kind of topics or kind of filters that people regardless of some of those barriers, we'll have a better chance of finding the work that we're doing, um, you know, that each of us are doing across the movement. Um, but also that piece of looking for something and finding that it is not there, that nobody else appears to be doing it, um, or that people are looking for particular resources and they don't exist is very important. So this idea of us tracking what people are looking for and they're not finding it is very important because we start getting into that kind of known unknowns then as regards what people are actually looking for at different points in say their their work that they're doing within the movement. So it's really, yeah, it's that, it's that findability, that discoverability piece is very important to me personally, but also to, to the project. Thanks. I like how you framed it because Meta is probably not a masterpiece in discoverability. So I look very much forward to that and would also like to ask Jessica a little bit more about you know, okay, Meta probably promises to have all the information, but no one will, no one will be able to find uh, them. But what is the additional promise of peer support and peer learning as a, as a, as a methodology? Yeah, so I, I think there's five points um, I'd like to highlight here. I think one of it, one of the important essences of peer learning is the flexibility um, and the horizontal aspect of it. So, um, as I said, people who are facing similar challenges, they can learn from each other's experience. Um, and this is very important in terms of building and strengthening our movement in which movements require multiple connections to happen um, in diverse moments of time um, and across geographies. So peer learning is um, an, a, 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 a an important aspect of creating that human-centered um, connection. And that this can happen in, um, it can be adapted to different ways of learning. We know that people learn in very different ways and structured training can sometimes be a bit more, um, uh, a bit more limited to people who like to learn more hands-on. They like to practice their learning. They learn from feedback. They learn from reflection. So peer learning, and this has been written a lot in, in, in educational context, it becomes an important way of having a very deeper contextualized um, form of learning. Um, the other thing, and this is quoting from a, a Let's Connect participant, because we're also piloting this and we already have 140 people um, connecting and we're getting feedback from them on the importance and significance of these connections and what's working, what's not working. And one thing they said was um, the best thing about this one on one connection is that I had time to focus on my needs and to really share what I needed to learn in my own context. And I didn't feel afraid to 
there was nobody else there kind of judging what I knew or didn't know. So I think um, that contextualized safe learning is very important in the movement as well. Um, and as I mentioned, it can help you through different stages of learning. So as um, Nicole was saying, there's you know different paths and journeys that people have in the movement. And sometimes they need formal training to really gather skills, but sometimes they just need to refresh and see what somebody else is doing. And so this adaptability to different stages of learning um, is important. And I would like to also emphasize that it doesn't replace other forms of capacity building. I think still um, formal structured training, um, capacity building through funding, through communities of practice are still very fundamental for those participants' journeys and building capacities as organizations. So peer um, for me learning is one element in, in that whole ecosystem of capacity building that that is being discussed in that recommendation six. Which kind of leads us to the next set of questions about this this ecosystem. So um, whenever we talk about the capacity of change or let's connect and people are like, yes, and then we should also do like the knowledge base and we should evaluate and we should document. And, you know, there's all these other pieces, obviously, that these projects or these initiatives currently are not addressing and very deliberately not addressing because you can't do everything at once. But maybe, um, maybe Rebecca, can you talk a little bit about what other pieces need to come into effect um, as part of this capacity building system and um, and how peer learning sort of fits in with that? It, it does feel a little bit like how, how long is a piece of string? Um, you know, that there is layers of complexity that we can draw into a project like this that just kind of to a certain extent, and we can see why maybe similar projects or projects that have attempted to address this this issue in the past have um, been uh, stymied or somewhat, you know, kind of were eventually kind of um, kind of overcome by all of these challenges. So I think by keeping the project that we're doing in particular discreet, uh, you know, kind of focusing perhaps on the platform and how we are interpreting at the moment, how people will interact with it and the needs that we have, I suppose, addressed the assumptions that we have at the moment. Um, and I think that's one of the big things we have. Both of our projects probably have a set of assumptions, um, a set of hypotheses that we have going into it. And what we are doing at the moment is testing those. So I think that's the really important piece that we're doing. Yes, we are aware of all these other things that have to happen and be drawn in in this kind of wider web um, of additional, um, I suppose, toolkits and uh, all sorts of complexities that we can draw into it. But until we get those base assumptions correct and that we actually understand the needs of those that we are hoping to benefit more fully by actually piloting something, by actually starting something, um, I think... Um, we're in danger of kind of falling into the same, the same challenges, the same issues that have been faced in kind of similar mapping capacity projects that have happened in the past, or kind of projects that look to address um, kind of peer learning across um, the communities. And also, we are probably in a better position technology-wise than we were two to three years ago, where people are more comfortable, perhaps, in the types of environments that will be used in both of these projects in a way that perhaps before the pandemic and before we we all had to, to adapt, um, that people might have been slightly more reticent or less comfortable with. Um, so I think for me, we are being quite, I suppose, uh, discreet in the project that we are addressing in this first phase, being very aware that it's not doing everything that we wanted to do eventually and that it will talk to other projects in the way that we're talking about these two projects kind of um, eventually kind of hopefully dovetailing together. But that we do need to kind of keep it discreet at this point, because otherwise we probably will never get off the, the starting blocks to use a, a, another, a, another turn of phrase or another metaphor. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. A discreet in the sense of focus on this one function that, that you're creating and hoping that the other functions are going to be complementary, like the knowledge base, I guess, is the one that um, we're being asked about a lot is 
you know, who's going to build that? Because all the stuff where people are learning from each other in a capacity or in, in a peer learning situation, um, there's so much wisdom there that, you know, so that those of us who think sort of at the meta level think we want to capture it and it must be documented and also it must be evaluated. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, Nicole had, a, I think, a question about how the two things connect to each other. Exactly. So they are on the one hand quite similar and on the other hand quite different. So could you or maybe could we explore a little bit what's the value of having these two different solutions as standalone and how are they probably also complementing each other? Um, Jessica, maybe you want to start off and then Rebecca can can add to it. And then we can also dive a little bit deeper into what this can also mean in the future. In my mind, it's, a, it's as I mentioned, a bit of um, like the capacity exchange I see as a connecting cell um, and as a tool that's going to be a fundamental um, support in terms of information and um, offering those connections in an open fashion and an easy fashion that we can't do today um, through Meta. And we've actually tried in this in a skills directory, we're using something on Meta now to connect people. Um, and we see all the difficulties that entail. So for us, the capacity exchange is gonna be a fundamental piece. And we hope to be one option out of many that already exist in the movement and others that should be built of where to direct people when they want to connect. And, and as I had mentioned, uh, Let's Connect offers some support for people to connect. So one thing that we found in this initial pilot that's been running for six months is that setting up people for that connection it can be quite important. So how um, we gather enough information about what it is that you really want to learn, what skills do you need to be able to learn from that person is there like a learning path and what are the necessary steps and have you gone through that um, learning path so that that connection is useful and you're not frustrated by that connection when you perhaps um, you know wanted something different um, so we're trying to support um, those connections by offering um, the information the organization the pedagogical kind of um, guidelines of how that can happen and then following up on that connection to see was that useful for you how did you put that into practice what could we do differently and we're finding out a lot of things of spaces that do work spaces that don't work um, so I think in putting that back into the capacity exchange and finding um, ways in which um, okay, we've made the connection through the system, but you know, where are the gaps in terms of how we support people? Is that impactful? Um, and where do we direct people who would want formal training? You know, through WikiLearn, through mocks, through external um, partners who can train. And so, I see the capacity exchange as a ball where you're sending people out to a lot of different um, opportunities, and that's where I see that the there needs to be a kind of discussion around what is the governance of that structure and how do we bring it together. So these two initiatives are focused very much on two pieces, but we, I think, very quickly need to create a wider discussion of what's the, what is the map of that ecosystem and how do we work together, who governs that, um, who organizes that, what funding is needed for that to work and operate as a coherent system. Um, so that's a really interesting discussion, I think, um, for us to to have in the future yeah thank you um because we've been like hearing this in some conversations we also talked about it what are potential redundancies of those two projects which can be a good thing because then you can test things and see what works well and what didn't uh, doesn't work so well for example but also maybe we are duplicating some of the functionalities and then also i mean maybe there's a potential conflict that 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 can arise from this, that people say, why are two projects doing the same thing? You are reinventing. That is also something that our movement probably is well known for, for reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, and how can we avoid that we, that we waste volunteers' time, for example, and address these potential conflicts really right from the start? Rebecca, do you, do you also see some... Uh, some of those redundancies or have you been maybe this is also initiation of continue having these conversation and 
continuing them together to see what makes most sense. Well, I think having that awareness of each other's projects at this point is is very important. And we also are aware of projects that are happening, um, say, in other parts of the world. Um, at the moment, the capacity exchange is kind of somewhat Eurocentric with an idea, again, of keeping it kind of um, contained in this kind of very pilot phase. But having these conversations, being very open with what sort of piloting, testing the different kind of methodologies that are be using we're using at this point, I think is fundamental to ensuring that we aren't, um, I suppose, duplicating work, uh, burning out volunteers, asking them to to populate two different platforms or to, you know, to, as you say, kind of duplicate the work that they're doing um, because we're doing things in, in siloed um, away from each other. If we are kind of open and transparent and have these conversations now, we can also be very clear with, with each other where the different projects are succeeding, but also where they're failing, um, where they are not meeting the expectations of the people that engage with them. Um, and again, coming back to those kind of testing those assumptions that we have going in, if we have two different methodologies now, we can start to to understand who we are serving best, um, who we aren't serving. Um, so those people who might engage with one project but not the other and have kind of request things that then are happening on the other, you know, in the other project, that sort of thing. So I would say that kind of, I suppose, having this broad reach or this broad kind of um, methodology at this point is definitely the way to do it because there we have so many unknowns now because, you know, this has not been done at this scale and perhaps kind of these kind of movement strategy goals at the heart of it. So now is the time to experiment and perhaps to do that broad brush and to perhaps have some of that overlap so that we can actually know for sure where things are are serving people and where they are not. Um, if we are still, you know, I suppose not to say stepping on each other's toes or, or duplicating work in six months, nine months, you know, to 18 months time, then it'll become problematic. But I think being fully aware and open about what we are doing, when, with whom, uh, at this point can only serve the movement strategy and the community as a whole better going forward. I want to come back a little bit uh, to what's actually happening when people peer learn. So, so sorry, that's not in the, in the script, but there's a, came a, a question came from the off here um, that I want to insert. And um, just so people, because we're talking very meta right now, you know, we're talking about our projects and how it connects at the meta level. And uh, let's come back to... Um, how is this going to help people? So, uh, Jessica, you said you had uh, you had already started and you had some interactions and some feedback already. Do you have like a, maybe like a really sweet example of something that how how peer learning sort of worked for for peers from the movement? Yeah. So one of the strategies is are these what we call one to one coffees or teas, um, and they can happen literally one to one. So. We use the skills directory today on Meta, um, which is basically a directory of what people want to learn and what they want to share based on when they registered for the system. And then they can find people um, based on those skills and based on their language, on their context, and they can request that connection. We've also done some proactive matching, so finding people to connect. Something that we've learned is that sometimes people feel perhaps a little bit wary of of making that connection themselves and they've had to be prompted a bit to understand and we've had a lot of newcomers come in as well and that's a, a, another reflection of something that we've learned um uh, so when when they um connect then um we they they have a coffee and tea we share information about what they want to learn, what are the learning outcomes, or if they just want to have a laugh and connect and have a coffee, which is just as important. So some of the feedback that we've had, um, some of the skills that they've shared around, um, how do I evaluate a small event and to see if it had impact? How do I um, you know, track volunteers and be able to see whether they'd be interested in coming back? Um, we've had some very on wiki sessions as well in terms of like learning the basics of wiki data and people go to workshops, but sometimes they don't get all the practice that is needed and all the like one to one support. So the workshop is a good introduction, 
But when they have doubts, they need that mentoring and the coffees and the teas um, really help so that they can dig deeper into that skills practice. So um, we've had about um, 70 people participate in these types of connections. We've also tried cluster groups. So we have one person who's sharing something with a number of learners in different contexts and they can share their challenges. Um, what we found with this is that it requires a lot of, of support and a lot of organization and finding a way to best scale that and that it continues to be community led and not led by the foundation, I think is very important. The foundation should be there to offer the support in terms of is funding needed so that connection happens, so you have connectivity, so you can dedicate the time to do this. What are your needs so the foundation can come and support that? Um, and obviously with you know knowledge as well that we can we can share as staff and people, but we do want those connections to be led by the community and the knowledge that shared is, is led by the community who's doing the work. Um, so finding a way of scaling that and making it community led is really, really community led is one of the, the challenges. Yeah, I can see that. I can see how that's going to be a challenge. I mean, one of the one of the things that we heard a lot during the movement strategy process is the word decentralization. So we want um, we want to be a, a movement to be less um, centralized organized uh, we want to be, be networked we want people to be able to connect so, uh, so some of the projects we're talking about today try to to do that however it turns out in order to create spaces to connect and network you need like a, some kind of central infrastructure that lets you do that <laughs> so that's a little bit the, the 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 paradox i guess that we're creating um and then there are also other other aspects that you you guys have also hinted at which are documentation and evaluation. Um, so to me, since I'm, I'm a little bit knowledgeable about the capacity exchange, I'm just going to insert, <laughs> changing hats. Um, I'm just going to insert one, one other thing, which, which is the mapping aspect. So um, um, what, what, is, what we're trying to do with the, with the capacity exchange is actually have a real-time map, right? right? Rebecca, can you talk a little bit about that? So that, Yes, people can connect with each other, but there's also a way to, um, to, to have an overview of what are the capacities uh, that are existing and what are the things that are needed, like you said earlier, that are not being answered when they're searched. And, and then for whoever in the movement runs capacity, building stuff um, to respond to those. Um, so that's. Do you want to say more about this, Rebecca, or did I just say, make make the whole point? I think I think I think you covered it very well there. But I think what we will also one of the one of the presumptions that I have is that what we might see is a divergence in language, um, and I don't mean you know kind of d different languages. What I mean is people looking for similar things but using very different language to approach it, um, because we have within our movement very specific jargon uh, when it comes to certain things. And when you are new to the movement or perhaps coming in from quite a different movement, you might have a whole other set of vocabulary to use for that, which might then offer quite a distinct challenge for, again, that discoverability piece, because you might be using a whole other set of, of terms for it. So that sort of map, and we might see that that might be, um, that might be geographic, you know, people around the world are using different terminologies for things that already exist, or we might find that it's kind of language based. So how terms get translated um, across the movement, you know, that we might see, kind of see subtleties there. Um, but I think one of the things that might be interesting going forward and kind of looking towards the hubs is that we might see kind of uh, geographic capacity specialities which is something that, say, is coming out of Wikimedia Argentina or Wikimedia uh, Sweden, where they are being quite proactive in those spaces to actually kind of set up kind of hubs or projects that can, can lend or map or otherwise document those capacities kind of based within a language or, or a, I suppose, a technical space. Um, so hopefully the map will also kind of, you know, accelerate or kind of add a further functionality to seeing that on our, on our global scale. Let's talk about hubs a little more. <laughs> Everyone's favorite topics, topic these days. Um, so how much of this is going to be centralized and how much of this is going to be 
maybe at one point when we do have regional hubs taken over by hubs. Do you, you guys have any visions? Yeah, here I, I speak very much on my personal opinion. I'm not representing the, the foundation or community resources, and but just on, on what I think could be the potential and participating in some of the hubs discussions. Um, and I'd just like to go back to a point that you made about the need for this centralized support. And I do see that that type of support in terms of um, a, a, a group of, of, of people using tools and providing um, support so these connections happen could be done and should be done in a decentralized fashion. Like today, what we're doing with the working group, the, the Let's Connect is organized by a community and foundation working group where six people, five, four of them are community members, and they're doing a lot of this support themselves. So we're discovering with them how, how do, what are the, the systems in place, the procedures, how do we document those procedures, what is working, what isn't, so that this knowledge can then be maybe transferred to any form of, of, of um, a, a structure, be it a hub or be it an affiliate themselves who does this, this work of, of supporting peer, peer connections or a regional group. So I really see this uh, and going to Rebecca's idea as well, that we're experimenting, but I also think documenting and evaluating what works so that we can not share this, this knowledge with others and say, for this to be scaled, this should be done, for example, through the hubs. These are the resources you need. This is the team you need. These are some of the things that we um, that we found in our evaluation of what works and what doesn't work and go on and experiment other things. So I, I see the hubs as being... Um, in future, hopefully, where a lot of this support could be centralized. And uh, as Rebecca said, we're seeing regional capacities um, in certain areas and skills and perhaps leading some of that capacity building with partners um, and movement led through communities themselves would be a really interesting thing. I don't think this can be scaled as, as we're doing it now. I don't think that the foundation should be leading it or we have just a small working group it, that it, we're doing enough to learn from it and to be able to um, think of how this could look like in the future, but it really does need like a community led, decentralized and resources to, to do this. Going back to your question, I think you need human resources to be able to operate. There's a lot of um, carpentry. There's a lot of day-to-day -day work connecting people, um, helping them, evaluating, doing focus groups, interviews, leading sessions, finding translators. You need teams in place to do that. You need resources as well as the technological tools. So um, all of that is what we're trying with this pilot to, to give a bit of dimension so that we have a sense of reality in the future of this could work on this scale, but with these it, conditions in place. So the scale could, we could imagine that the scale is a regional hub. So, so what we're, what you're doing right now with this pilot, with this test group could be done on a regional level and then, you know, maybe reduce at least the language issues that Rebecca talked about a little bit. I want to get to this sort of the, the visionary level a little bit here. And we've talked about, you know, the method of peer learning. We talked about um, peer matching, about decentralization and all those things. And, and about, well, we didn't really talk about, but the need of eventually to evaluate programs like that. But what are some of the immeasurable effects of people connecting maybe that can benefit our movement? Can you guys talk to this? I'd relate to two, two things that I've learned from talking to some of the, the participants. I think one was that I, idea of um, connecting to somebody who they wouldn't naturally connect to because they just don't know that that person's there, but also they might f feel that they can't connect to that person. So maybe the case of a newcomer um, who is starting to organize work with somebody who's been in the movement for 10 years. So when that connection happened, um, the feeling of being kind of heard and 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 they continue to connect after that. So th those connections, the idea is the initial kind of push leads to multiple different ways of connecting if they liked. And so there were email exchanges and then there were telegram exchanges and just discovering that 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 happened and that the person felt very heard and seen. I think that was important. Um, the other thing that was an interesting experience around proposal writing, we've done a lot of learning clinics around proposal writing where we have um, community members come in and talk about like how they developed their um, 
their proposal, their theory of, of change and their evaluation. And what we always emphasize as well, talk about the, the failures or the mishaps or the things that didn't go very well or that were confusing and hard. And, um, and that led to a mentorship between people um, like, you know, Argentina, Chile, uh, Uruguay, who have developed proposals over a series of years to very like new first time grantees. And they've been like really digging deep into, um, you know, learning from each other and what you want to, what, what is the change you want to bring about. But talking about failures, I think is also really, really important. And that's where we're taken out of the conversation as like foundation or grant makers. And that that um, I think when that happens between colleagues, um, that's very powerful. Um, and so based on those conversations and organizations said, we're not ready. They're from the Caribbean. They said, we're not ready to present a proposal, but let's keep on talking. A year down the line after that first connection, they're now going to present it, you know, after having been supported for, 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 for a while. Um, so I think that those are the, I guess they're measurable, but hard to measure. And that's what we're trying to track. Well, I think that's, that's a, there's a, there's a few things there, um, for me as both somebody who's been within the community, but then also kind of engaging with these projects is that, um, quite often, not only are people perhaps not aware that that, that mentorship is available or is something that I suppose has happened informally within the movement in the past and that perhaps more established chapters and groups that, you know, Jessica was referencing there, the, the likes of Argentina and, and um, groups like that, that there is the ability as, you know, kind of an emerging group to approach them and to talk about these things. Um, and what we, you know, what is found within kind of this area of, I suppose, professional development or mentoring is that quite often those people who need mentoring most perhaps are less likely to seek it out. So I think that perhaps flagging to people. So within these kind of conversations about, about grants or about other resources, that this is flagged and, and perhaps made quite concrete. It's like not just we think you should be mentored in this kind of wide, broad sweep of the like, but specifically we can help you with this grant writing process and we can help you build capacity and, and build knowledge and um around that so that you feel then as a group you can do it as opposed to somebody coming in and perhaps giving you homework or assignments uh, to do over over a period of time. Um, one thing that, that kind of stands out for me within that is also making the work of the very large, very established groups that for as a new user group can feel so alien to you. Like, you know, they have staff, they have, you know, grants that have gone on for years, they have all of these partnerships that they've developed. What do they have in common with my user group that's you know two months old and there's three of us or what whatever it is? So I think kind of that reflective work breaking it down into well roll back the tape five years this is where we were and this is what we did, um you know again kind of breaking them down into cons into concrete pieces and and being aware of perhaps the the background the silent work, the undocumented work that kind of interpersonal stuff that happened within your country or within your language context that allowed then what looked like this big project that came out of out of nowhere. Um, so I suppose that um, that awareness just around how you make things seem accessible to newcomers or newer groups or groups that lack very specific capacities and that would it would be very difficult for them to generate those capacities within their particular context without any support, um, I think is very important. and and. It's it's good to hear that kind of reflective piece happening uh, within Let's Connect. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to wish you both much success uh, with, with the projects and hope they connect and that they become part of this great ecosystem and we can build the Wikimedia movement together. Um, we're going to go take a little break now and then move on to the next section. Thanks. So... We are going to do a new segment today, which is called The People Behind the Movement. <laughs> um, and we had this idea because there's two really great people to ask questions other than maybe capacity building. First, I wanted to ask Jessica about her new perspective on the movement because you joined last year. And what? how is it for you as a movement newcomer? what makes a movement and probably also what makes us a movement, what pieces are here and what is still missing to be 
a movement Wow, big actually. question. Um, I'd, I'd kind of like to start from how I felt um, the first few days and something that was both positive and curious for me was that I went from knowing absolutely nothing about the Wikimedia's movement um, to you know reading about it hours on end and being absolutely fascinated and not being able to speak about anything else for days. <laughs> so I felt that this, it was very clear to me and I've worked in political movements um, and activist movements and I'm very, um, I guess, driven by equity and social um, developmental issues. So it really struck me the, the vision. I think that having a very clear vision, the first thing I read was you know, movement strategy recommendations. Um, and I was just very excited. And then when I arrived into the foundation, I thought, wow, if this is so big, why don't other people know about it? And it, it, it made me, well, why didn't I know about it if I've been connected to this world in, you know, in Latin America, because I'm Latin American, English grew up, you know, moving around the world. And how did I not know that this, this was happening? So it made me just try to discover like, what, what is, what is missing? Why isn't this known? Um, and then another thing that struck me in the first few days is that Usually in social movements, there's a lot of complexity. I think that's the nature of movements. Um, but you usually have kind of an idea of how the connections happen and where they happen and who is part of it. And I remember continuously asking in meetings, like, who is the community? And always getting like very different answers. So sometimes, oh, here's the map of like their affiliates and their users. And then you have editors here and you have volunteers. But really understanding those different connections um, and, and and being able to map them for me was very hard. And it still is hard. Like every day I kind of discover, hey, but here it doesn't operate like that. And there are people who don't feel that they're part of the movement and they're not connected to the user group. But however, they're arriving and let's connect and they're eager to learn and to organize. So how does this, this operate, you know? Um, so I think one of the things that for me is, is a challenge is is understanding those those multiple um, connections, and that would help us understand where there are missing pieces of you know why don't people feel part of the movement. Um, the other thing that I felt is also I'm talking on a very personal level, like the the barriers to entry. So I became really excited about entering the movement, but suddenly I realized that there was a lot that I had to understand, and I was kindly reminded how newcomer I was in at several meetings and that I hadn't read this document or I hadn't understood this of the past and I hadn't understood this conflict or this tension. And so it sometimes becomes a bit dis disheartening when, you know, when I've been in other social movements, I've walked through the door and they're like, here's your badge, here's your sticker, go out and just feel that you're part of this. And it wasn't until the library's convention when I was actually with community members after a year of working in the foundation that somebody a, w a woman from a filial barbarian like tied a thing around my head and she's like my friend and she just gave me a hug and I was like this is what I was I was hoping for you know like I'm foundation staff but I want to be part of a movement this is what drives me this is what makes me excited and 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 I and I and I and I needed just that sense of identity and being seen and being heard and I I I've I felt that that came late from in my experience so maybe that's the same for for other people and obviously COVID and this like lack of, of, of human face-to-face -face connection plays a role, but there's other elements um, I think as well. And I would just finally, and I don't want to like focus on the <laughs> negatives at all, but just thinking of the missing pieces, because for me, they're so important, um, is that I was so taken by the movement strategy and I thought, well, then this must have an action plan, you know, because movements, although they're ephemeral and there's multiple connections and pieces and they change a lot over time, you know, they have, apart from a vision, a kind of, and an ideology, they have a kind of, this is how, where we're going and this is who's doing it and this is what we're, and so not having that framework, I think for me was, was really interesting <laughs> to say the least, but I hope we're moving in that direction um, because I do think a movement needs that sense of, of clarity. And I believe entirely, and I speak as Jessica, 
around not only decentralization but distribution and that um that i think that the the implementation needs to to have a, a lot of different governance pieces um so it was interesting from the foundation being part of this like central node that is often very criticized and but myself wanting to be part of this movement that and and that for me has been really challenging that i hope that i you know i'm here to to contribute and, and break some of those I can say that after 12 years or more with this movement, I still haven't found a good map of the movement. So many people have tried uh, to draw it and so on, but to really draw it in a representative way, I think it's almost impossible because every, someone will always hate <laughs> it because it doesn't represent one connection well enough or something like that. So we've tried that. And um, yeah, thanks, Jessica. That was that was super. Super interesting and also I think good for other new people to hear actually that they are not alone, that this feeling of being overwhelmed, of not using the right language and so on, it will, um, I think many people will experience that and it might be helpful to hear from you about it. So Rebecca, we're in awe because you're, you're like <laughs> doing this podcasting thing much longer than we have been doing it. And so we're so honored to have you on this podcast. Um, talk a little bit about your podcast in the world according to Wikipedia. Fame, fame, shameless Excellent. plug department. Excellent. Always, always here for the shameless plug. Um, so myself and um, a non-Wikimedian, a uh, very good friend of mine, Fanula. Um, so she's kind of my foil. So she's the non-Wikimedian. So I explain the world according to Wikipedia to Fanula and our audience. Um, so each week we talk to somebody from the movement. So that could be somebody like who's won Wikimedian of the Year or a librarian in Scotland who's been working on Wikisource during the pandemic with, with staff members looking at transcribing uh, pamphlets from you know the, the, the library of the National Library of Scotland. Um, so each so really I suppose fundamentally it's it's the humans of Wikimedia is really what the podcast is, it's to bring that element of humanity um, to it so that, you know, people so often talk about Wikipedia like this big monolith, you know, like this, uh, you know, this technological thing that sits on the internet. But actually, we all know it's it's the community, it's the people that make it and the, the levity, the fun, the sincerity, um, the hard work that people put into quite often very invisible parts of what makes the Wikimedia movement work, what makes the technology work, what makes you kind know, of Google or Siri or whatever spit out a, a correct answer to you, perhaps in your own language and not always in English. Um, and I just wanted to, as as we say in our promo, like pop the lid, uh, look at the engine, look at the internal workings, tease out some of those interesting stories. Uh, so we talk about our heroes of the episode. We talk about the random rules. So those kind of quirky, funny, historical things that why does Wikipedia do things in a certain way? Well, here's the story behind it. Um, and then, as I said, we interview somebody um, and we talk about the project that they've done, the accolade that they've won, you know, kind of the interesting project that they got up off the ground. Um, just so that people realize that it's really that kind of passionate um, engagement that a lot of people all around the world actually make make Wikipedia and the sister projects, uh, you know, interesting. And as Jessica was saying, also talking about, you know, the complexities when, you know, especially with those rules, when we're supposed to not have any rules, you know, that we're so laden with our own bureaucracy um, and uh, history at this point and, and peeling back a little bit of that and kind of talking about it in, in, an, in an open um, sort of way. Uh, I think is is important for ourselves as a community to talk to each other. I mean, I love talking to my interviewee every two weeks, but equally then sharing it with a wider community and hopefully talking it in a, talking about it in a way that makes it accessible. So I can highly recommend this podcast, "The World According to Wikipedia." You can find it anywhere you you get your podcasts, and I highly recommend listening to it. It's awesome. It's very very uh, entertaining. Also, all right, so that's a wrap of the fifth episode of Wikimove. Thank you guys for being here. Rebecca, Jessica, really appreciate the conversation. Thanks to our listeners for listening. And Wikimove is a production of Wikimedia Deutschland and its movement strategy and global relations team. 
Eva Martin pulls all the strings in the background. She makes sure that technology runs smoothly, but also the also she thinks with us to create the excellent content. Our music was composed and produced by Rory Gregory and is available, of course, under a CC BY SA license on Wikimedia Commons. And thank you very much to our wonderful guests, Rebecca and Jessica. It's been a great pleasure having you with us. We release new episodes every month and we hope that new ideas are born from these conversations in Wikimove and collaborations are kickstarted. Please visit our Wikimove meta page or react to our podcast, connect with other listeners, subscribe to always be notified of our new episode releases and also give us suggestions on who should be on the show and what we should talk about. If you missed uh, our previous episode, check it out on our meta page. You can also contact us as Wikimove at, at Wikimove at wikimedia.de to continue this discussion and share your suggestions. Ciao for now. Bye-bye.